Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in this lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we're going to introduce triodes. But first, let's start with a good old-fashioned light bulb, which you can get by taking a sealed glass container, putting a filament into it, passing a current through that filament. Maybe it's DC, maybe it's AC, but in either case, the filament will glow. And for our purposes here, more importantly, it will get hot. In order to get an actual vacuum tube, first of all, of course, it needs to be a vacuum, we need to introduce a cathode. And when the cathode gets hot, happy little electrons essentially boil off the cathode and they hang out. Now, I know that all of the physicists are going to complain the term boiling off is not an accurate description of what's going on with these electrons, but the electrons are hanging out and this will be a good enough analogy for now. Anyway, the electrons have nowhere to go. We want to give them somewhere to go. So we can introduce a plate, another element, also known as an anode. And if the terms anode and cathode sound familiar from your explorations of diodes, that's not a coincidence. I'm going to indicate the voltages at the plate and the cathode using this VP with this little upside down T and VK with a little upside down T. We're using K instead of C because we typically use C for things like the speed of light or more often electrical engineering. We use C for capacitance and we don't want to get confused. And I think K is also the start of the German word for cathode, so that works out. The upside down T's represent ground, so we're measuring the voltage of the plate with respect to ground and the cathode with respect to ground. And a little bit later I'll talk about why I want to emphasize that distinction. I'm using the upside down T here instead of G because later we're going to use G to stand for grid. So I'm going to let VPK represent the voltage at the plate relative to the voltage at the cathode. Now, the reason I want to make this distinction with this little ground symbol here is that a lot of times people will just write VP and what they mean is voltage at the plate with respect to the cathode. And there can be confusion about whether you mean voltage at the plate with respect to ground or whatever. So I like to make that explicit all the time. But most data sheets will call what I'm calling VPK, they'll call it just something like VP. So if the voltage at the plate is higher than the voltage at the cathode, the happy little electrons that have boiled off of the cathode are discouraged from hanging out by the cathode and encouraged to be drawn towards the plate. So they'll fly from the cathode to the plate. Now, something that's a little odd about electrical engineering is we define something called a conventional current flow. That's the opposite of the direction that the electrons are flowing in. That's because the people who were discovering these principles a long time ago made some guesses as to what was reality, and they just kind of guessed wrong at one point. So there you go. Anyway, this gives us a conventional current that flows down through the plate, and that continues to flow down through the cathode. But if the voltage at the plate is lower than the voltage at the cathode, then no current flows. So this forms a good old-fashioned diode. Current flows in one direction, but not the other direction. And the current, when it does flow, is equal to a constant times the voltage difference between the plate and the cathode to the 3 halves power. So that's 1.5. So that's a much gentler curve than the really sharp curve you get from the exponential of a solid state diode. That 3 halves exponent comes from a lot of complicated physics having to do with something called space charge. Vacuum tube diodes are sometimes used as rectifiers in power supplies of guitar amps, although nowadays solid-state rectifiers are also used. They did make tubes like the 6H6 that were small signal diodes for signal processing purposes instead of power rectification purposes, although these aren't really used very much nowadays. Now, in the introduction, I promised you a lecture on triodes, not diodes. To make a triode, we need to introduce the grid, and we'll represent the voltage at the grid with respect to ground with this symbol here. So if the voltage at the grid relative to the voltage at the cathode is negative, some of the electrons that are flying across from the cathode to the plate are going to be discouraged by that negative potential on the grid, which restricts the flow of current. Note that I could turn a triode into a diode by just connecting the grid and the cathode. 
The plate, grid, and cathode on a triode are analogous to the collector base and emitter on a bipolar junction transistor or the drain, gate, and source on a field effect transistor. We have field effect transistors that come in the form of metal oxide semiconductor FETs or junction FETs. MOSFETs come as enhancement mode or depletion mode devices, whereas JFETs only come as depletion mode devices. And in that sense, a vacuum tube is more analogous to a JFET in that it acts as a depletion mode device, although I should put depletion mode in quotes because the underlying physics is different. Modern electrical engineering students are probably much more familiar with MOSFETs since they form the basis of most modern digital circuitry than they are with JFETs, but JFETs are a lot of fun, and we'll look at them later in the class when we talk about guitar effects pedals, where we will use them essentially as voltage-controlled resistors. Now, the transistors I've drawn here are all N-type devices, NPN transistors in the case of the BJT, or N-channel transistors in the case of the FETs. These transistors also have P-type equivalents, namely PNP transistors for the BJTs, and P-channel type devices for the FETs. Unfortunately, there's no P-type equivalent of a vacuum tube. So any of the techniques you learn in a standard analog electronics class that involve complementary pairs, where you have both N-type and P-type MOSFETs, like in a modern CMOS process, or you have both NPN and PNP transistors, well, those very circuits that you learn have no equivalent in the tube domain. It's like having to do your entire design with just NPN transistors or just NFETs. So what's the actual equation that governs this behavior? Well, if the plate to cathode voltage is positive, we have current flowing, and the grid to cathode voltage is negative, so if we have a negative voltage on the grid relative to the cathode, the current flowing through the plate is governed by this equation. Now, notice we have two regimes. There is a regime where there's actually no current flowing at all, and this is a pinch-off region where the grid has gone so negative that none of the electrons over here want to fly over to the other side. But there's this big useful range where the current's governed by this three halves law, Notice that if I set GK to zero, then we get that diode equation that we had earlier. So I guess I should clarify that VGK doesn't need to be strictly negative. It can also be equal to zero. It basically has to be non-positive. This new parameter mu is called the amplification factor, and it's going to be super important throughout the course. It's typically pretty, pretty big. So notice that changes in the grid voltage have a much stronger effect on the current than changes in the plate voltage. Now, I want to emphasize that phrase, right proper operation. If you have the grid going positive, that's an extreme failure mode. The grid in that case is going to conduct. Electrons will flow through it. The input impedance at this grid, which is normally effectively infinite, will totally collapse. And you get a kind of distortion called blocking distortion, and that's a disaster. That's a kind of distortion that not even mid-90s era Trent Reznor would like. It sounds like a farting swamp dragon that just ate a Volkswagen. Now, truth be told, we're not really going to use this equation very much, and as far as I can tell, most other people don't use this equation very much either. Instead, what you do is you go to the data sheet and you look at some curves. So there's three different quantities here. There's the plate to cathode voltage, the grid to cathode voltage, and the plate current. And we only have two dimensions, so we have to pick things to fix and then plot the other things. So here's a transfer characteristic curve. This is also called a transconductance curve. So the idea here is that we fix a particular plate cathode voltage. Here they call it EB. I have no idea why. And for that given voltage, you plot the plate current versus the grid to cathode voltage. Notice that tube amps are typically run at pretty high voltages, and here you can see why. These curves become lower on the chart as you lower the plate to cathode voltage. So those various bits of gear that run their tubes off of a plate voltage of 48 volts, they might be, uh, well, yeah, there's a reason people didn't do that back in the day. Notice that the tube naturally conducts for a grid cathode voltage of zero, and it starts to pinch off the current as you decrease the grid voltage. 
that's opposite of something like a BJT or an enhancement mode NFET, where if the base to emitter voltage or the grid to source voltage is zero, it's off and you have to increase that control voltage in order to get it to conduct. Notice that for any given VPK, there is a special grid cathode voltage below which you don't get any conduction, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Oh, I should mention that the F here in EF stands for filament, so the filament voltage here is 12.6 volts. That's not terribly important to our current discussion. Now, if we keep plotting the current on the vertical axis, but swap the roles of VGK and VPK, we come up with a set of curves like this. The data sheet calls these average plate characteristics. My colleague Marshall Leach liked to call these output characteristics. And here we have a family of curves associated with fixing a particular VGK. And here we see how the current varies with changes in the plate to cathode voltage. Remember, VGK can't be positive, so we don't have curves up here in the upper left corner. And this curve here for VGK equals zero, this is essentially the most current you can get for a given plate to cathode voltage. And this current goes down as you decrease the voltage on the grid. The data sheet calls the grid to cathode voltage EC, no idea why. Oh, I forgot to mention that this is from the General Electric data sheet for the 12AX7. This is an extremely common tube in audio in general and guitar amplifiers in particular. So we're going to spend a lot of time with these kind of curves over the course of the semester. Now, remember that to get current flowing, we need to have mu VGK plus VPK be bigger than zero. We can ask a question like, where is it exactly zero in order to find a cutoff voltage below which we won't get any current? So if we solve that out, we get a formula that looks like minus the plate to cathode voltage divided by our amplification factor mu. At least that's the theory. If we look at the actual curves, we see this isn't really the case in practice. So the published spec for mu for 12AX7 is 100, which is a nice number. If we take 300 and divide it by 100, that would give us 3, which would give us minus 3. But that's here, and we have 0.5 milliamps flowing. We have to get to below minus 4 before we actually pinch off the voltage. Similarly, if we look at this 200 curve for the VPK, well, if I take 200 and divide it by 100, that would give me 2. But again, here at minus two, I have some current flowing. You have to get to almost minus three volts before it shuts off, similarly all the way through. The main underlying issue is that you have to remember that formula I showed you earlier with that three halves power, that's just a mathematical model that fits the data and goes along with some theory that involves some simplifying assumptions. If you try to actually fit these curves to that three halves power law, Mu is not entirely constant over the full range of currents. It's mostly 100 through all of the practical ranges your amplifier is operating at. But when you get to low currents, mu actually drops a bit. So this formula is not really valid because if you try to use the mu that's useful in the main part of the range, it's not really useful here at this lower extreme. So this formula should be considered suspect. If you want to know what the cutoff voltage is, you really need to go eyeball it from the charts and not trust a formula like this.